That's right, everybody. It's summertime. Well, not technically, but it's summertime in Hollywood. That means summer blockbusters, and we're here today to do our fandom movies a summer blockbuster breakdown. We're This is my predictions for the top five fiscal earners in the domestic box office from the months of May to the end of August. And we'll go back over after the end of August. So starting off, we're going with the top box office earner predictions. So remember that movies like Fate of the Furious and Beauty and the Beast that have yielded a staggering billion dollars uh, globally so far are not included in this list. They did not make the cutoff for the time frame. And... There is only one movie that I'm doing that has already premiered as of this recording, and that is the number five pick, Guardians of the Galaxy. This, again, is written and directed by James Gunn. This has added to the all-star cast with Sylvester Stallone and Kurt Russell. This is the one that I struggled with a little bit, but I have to believe that this movie actually will stick in the top five. Marvel not only has movies that are money makers, but... They do well with the critics, too. In the other one, the one that I was kind of struggling with putting on a list or not, if I would have had the top 10, I definitely would have put this one in. Just as a side note, I guess as a runner-up, Thor Ragnarok. I'm really looking forward to it. I think that the Thor movie is definitely some undeserving scrutiny, but I do admit that they are some of the weakest of the Marvel Universe. But I think that this one definitely has uh, a lot of... A lot of aspects to it that could really set it apart. And I think people are more excited for this one, especially than they were for like Dark World or anything. So I think that this could really revive Thor's standalone movies. And I, I really hope the best for it. It definitely would have been in my top 10. But that's the reason I didn't do a top 10 is because it's kind of, it's a little bit easier to pick the top 10. Now the order, that's tricky. But I think that I definitely could get the top 10. So I wanted to kind of make it a little bit harder and a little bit more interesting. That's why we're doing top five. So unfortunately, Thor didn't make it, but uh, Guardians of the Galaxy did. So Marvel is sneaking in there at number five. In moving on, movies, same genre, different universe. That is DC's Wonder Woman. Now, I've been really looking forward to this. And this was uh, one I struggled with as well. But even though DC movies are not ever the recipients of uh, mass critical acclaim or even any type of critical acclaim they are the recipients of lots and lots of money for even when they serve just big piles of dog crap uh, people go back for seconds and thirds so I, i'm hoping this one isn't a big pile of dog crap this one it is it does have zach snyder as a run play was done by alan heinberg and the director it was uh, patty jenkins so I've been really excited for this. Like I said, uh, I like the setting. I like the cast. Gal Gadot is uh, beautiful, and she's talented. And I think that whether or not her future lays within the DC universe or the Wonder Woman franchise, I think that she's going to be successful. At least I hope she's going to be. Robin Wright from House of Card fame and a, a, a lot of other great projects. She's been in the business for a while now, is joining the cast. And uh, Chris Pine as well, which I think is they have all the ingredients to make something and it's not a a big plate of shit but uh, you know that they've also had great ingredients before it's before and not created a very tasteful uh, choice on the fact of he is accepted within the fandom and he like he's no stranger to these movies with his uh, star trek fame and he's he's got some range he's a good actor uh, I, I wouldn't say he's the best but he, he's good he's good and i think it it's definitely a solid choice this whole cast is solid and the premise is solid um world war one as the setting is really Really smart. I think that they're playing a little bit off Captain America, but making it different enough. Now, it's a little bit worrisome because the early screenings of these movies have generated some bad press and from critics and journalists. And that's another thing we're going to talk about is when I talk about critically acclaimed, what I mean by that and, and kind of how they do the rating system and how I'll be making my predictions and what I, we will be able to go back and look at to reference because it is kind of subjective. Uh, there's never been a great way to do ratings on anything from anything from the Nielsen box to uh, the tomato meter now has all been kind of fucked in my opinion, but it is what it is. Moving along, we are going to our number three pick and that pick is Cars 3. Now, I am not a, a huge, huge Pixar fan. I, I can appreciate uh, them for what they are. I, I take my niece to them. 
and that's about it. This cast doesn't excite me one bit. Um, I'm not a Larry the Cable guy type of person, but I, I can see the novelty of it. It's, its release date is June 16th, and it is the third installment of the series. And the marketing of Cars 3 has been a little bit interesting as well. They kind of teased a darker theme in the first trailer, which I'll link below. And that, that got a lot of people talking. I think that's what they wanted, because a little thing that they didn't say is that this is the first G-rated Pixar film since um, Monsters. A lot of people like these movies. Um I don't think they're ever going to stop making them. I know people aren't as excited for this one, but there's definitely, like I said, the marketing, there's definitely got people, uh, it's, there's a buzz about this movie. So, again, this isn't my list. The next list is the ones that I want to see, and this list is the ones I think are going to make money, and I think that Cars 3 is going to uh, land in the number three spot. So, critical acclaim, I don't know. They probably won't hate it. It's kind of kind of hard for critics to sit there and be shitty about kids' movies, but there are some pretty shitty actors in this, in my opinion. So, Cars 3 at number 3 comes out June 16th if you got kids, if you uh, enjoy cartoons about talking cars, or if you're really into that Pixar theory that I actually like about everything being connected, uh, yeah, go check this one out. But, uh, yeah, I think it's gonna I think it's going to make some money. So, number 3 on my list, Cars 3. I think, what, what, what is it even called? Oh, it's just called Cars 3. So I thought they had a, I thought they had a name for it other than that. But hey, fuck it. Why? Why would they bother? So Cars 3. It's going to make money. That brings us to our number two pick. This is a big one. Uh, it's definitely big. Uh, I don't know what else to say about it. But it is Transformers of the Last Night. Transformers movies make a shit ton of money. Uh, I actually like the first uh, Transformers. I'm not uh, ashamed to say it. I actually really liked it. I don't even know why, but I wasn't even a big fan of like the cartoon or the toys when I was a child, and that's like right in my. I'm the exact age that the toys were at their height until I assume now, and the cartoon was on, so it just it never caught my attention. But I enjoyed uh, the first one a lot, and. I even even Megan Fox, I enjoyed her performance. I mean, it wasn't terrible. Uh, Shia LaBeouf is probably a guy I couldn't sit across from at a bar for more than five minutes without punching. But he did a. I mean, I don't know. He did what he did. Uh, he did what Shia LaBeouf does, which is just I don't know what the fuck to call that. But um, yeah, uh, it, it, it's number two. I mean, Transformers make so much money uh, this this one has a, a pretty interesting cast too they've got an anthony hopkins that is uh coming straight off of westworld and obviously sir freaking anthony hopkins and mark Wahlberg's back in it he can handle michael bay like in the case of black sales because michael bay is just there because they have big ass set pieces they need to do and you need a michael bay or or you're fucked uh, but michael bay seems to have a lot more control over these movies than he's a lot more involved in in I, it seems like uh the the storytelling <laughs> which usually means there is no story and i guess that this he said this is the last one that he's gonna do uh he said this is the last uh trans he said this is the last transformers i'm gonna do well, for now, at least, unless I get another story. So that's not, I mean, why even say that? Why even say this is the last one I'm going to do unless I get a good story or, they, you know, or two years goes by and I just definitely do another Transformers. Uh, I mean, in, in, unless I get a good story, I don't think that's one thing Michael Bay's ever said in his life. I mean, that doesn't describe Michael Bay. Oh, he's got to have a good story for Michael Bay. But I, I'm getting too much into it. It's going to make a shit ton of money. And if we were doing global, this thing would the thing skyrocket this thing is going to hit a billion global um the overseas market love movies like this they love transformers they love heavy cgi big uh, set pieces futuristic stuff uh, especially china and stuff and nothing wrong with that whatsoever it's just it's a fact so they do really well globally so uh number two though yeah transformers the last night of michael bay production so it's gonna make money people that's what those movies do they make money so uh, my number one pick is 
Spider-Man Homecoming. I think that this is uh, going to maybe maybe mimic what happened with the first uh, reboot of the Spider-Man series. Not Andrew Garfield, the first uh, live action, I guess. I might be incorrect. There could have been some crap before that. But the, the one with uh, Tobey Maguire. I, I, think that we could, I think we could see a turnout of that level. Which, which was record-breaking at the time. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but uh, I really like Tom Holland. I thought he did a great job in Civil War. I like how he is actually acting like a kid. I like how it seems to be self-contained. I like everything about this movie, and I don't like Spider-Man that much. I don't hate him. I mean, you can't hate Spider-Man. I do agree that he is one of the more... Um, he's one of the more realistic superheroes, if that's not, it's a pretty dumb thing to say, I guess, but he, he deals in the comics with some pretty realistic teenage stuff i mean as realistic as you can get if you're like also like a human spider but i mean he's got you know drama in high school and shit like that so uh, I, it's pretty contained and I, I love things that are contained i love deadpool i love uh the the netflix uh series of daredevil so on so on so i, I think it's gonna be a, a good movie and i don't even I, don't, I just don't care for spider for some reason i don't know if it's because of the toby mcguire movies which they they never really caught my attention but I think Tom Holland's an excellent addition to the uh, MCU. This one's coming out July 7th. This is looking like it's going to... Right now, uh, Sony is is sharing. They're sharing because they're like, oh, man, we keep making shitty movies. So maybe Marvel, maybe we'll let you guys in. Maybe we'll let you guys in and help out a little bit if you could do anything. You know, uh, we got this, but uh, you guys can come and help. Um, So... So Sony's being very gracious by letting Marvel in. Just give the fucking superheroes back to Marvel. <laughs> give the X-Men back, too. Give them to somebody other than you, Sony. So uh, I hope I hope, I hope hope Sony keeps playing nice, too. And let's, well, I guess this, let, let's wait to say that until after this movie, because who knows how much creative control they maintain. Uh, I mean, because if you've ever seen Fantastic Four, if they maintained even the slightest bit of creative control, they could have fucked this up. But again, I'm not a big Spider-Man fan. I'm not a hater either, but I think that people are going to be lining up to see this movie. I mean, people, I mean, I don't remember what the YouTube views were on the trailer, but it, it was sick. So, uh, you know, and Tom, Tom Holland's a talented kid, so I wish him the best. Uh, number one, that's my number one pick. July 7th, people, homecoming. So the, go see it now because I need to be right. So I don't want to look like an asshole. So July 7th, uh, Spider-Man Homecoming, my number one pick for top yielding uh, domestic box office movie. So the next part of the list that I am going to be doing is going to be the segment where I talk about which movies I feel will receive the most critical acclaim praise um in this of course is a a little bit troublesome to prove uh in september how right i was or how wrong i was since it is kind of subjective and especially when there's so much hate and controversies going on over rotten tomatoes uh so i'll just touch on that really quick rotten tomatoes is it's not a perfect system but if you even look into like the especially the early uh way the early um even if you look into the early process of uh, rating television or film, especially with television with the Nielsen system, it is just, it's a shit show. And things have gotten a lot better, in my opinion. And it, a lot of this has to do with if you want to be informed about something, you need to go and be informed by going out and getting the information yourself. So when when talking about things like Rotten Tomatoes, uh which we will use as a platform uh, to look and see how close uh, these predictions are. And not that that really matters all that much, but just this is a little bit of something that's interesting uh, to me. Uh, and I have a love of film and television and writing and uh, acting, and that's because I you know, do have some formal schooling and training in production and film and enthusiast and uh, yes i do have like more uh formal training than your average person does but here's here's the point um there's also film critics professional film critics that have less training than i do and there's film critics that have a hell of a lot more uh and this is where rotten tomatoes comes in this is a a large large group of critics from all uh walks of uh life and the point being is there are people in there that are you're like Juilliard student and your NYC film school student and then there's your average 
guy that just is a huge film buff and you know has watched every single uh film of you know their favorite genres and is obsessive and is really good at dissecting things just naturally and is really good at connecting with the um viewers and readers whatever so it's it's a accumulative um score that is obtained by combining all these people's um all these different critics submissions and reviews so of course if a movie gets a bad tomato score a um uh, if, if they get a you know a poor rating on, on the tomato meter it, it doesn't necessarily for sure mean that it's bad because again these are people's opinions no matter how much of an educated uh, opinion it is it doesn't always mean it's right and it doesn't always mean that it that it is aligned with your own thoughts um i, I just i wasn't going to show the video but i'm not going to do it uh, i was somebody talking about oh when people watch rotten tomatoes they go into a movie assuming it's bad then because they saw the bad uh tomato score well okay but if you just go like you used to have to um, way before I was even born and when there's only a handful of film critics that wrote for only um, like things like the like the journal and uh, the times and um, f papers in Los Angeles Chicago and New York were like the hubs you know you had to go out and seep out these these um, articles catered you know film theory students and like I said like NYC uh, film school grads and stuff like that and y you didn't have somebody in your local newspaper until you know like five to ten years after um, the start of the actual industry uh, uh, the, the actual critic industry the actual film um, the actual and you didn't even have uh, much more than a handful of these people what makes a film critic well I'm here and I'm discussing to a point uh, my opinions on films and my predictions and I yes like I just said I have a small amount of formal training and I am not a film critic but I am not a film critic by any means I don't know if I'd even want to ever try to consider myself one um, but here's why let's say I do hypothetically and I wanted to submit I want to do a Dunkirk review uh, in a few days and what would make me be able to do that on YouTube I can, I can do it. I, maybe I might do it, but I can't submit that to, uh, you know, Rotten Tomatoes because I, you do have to have certain qualifications and those qualifications are, um, they're not perfect, but they have standards set for all walks of, uh, this industry. They have, you know, if you are on a social network platform like, uh, YouTube or, you know, even if you have your own vlog or vlog, um, if you write for a newspaper, it has to have a certain amount of readers. If you have a YouTube channel, you have to have a certain amount of unique, uh, a good amount too. It's pretty high. I'll send, I'll put the link in the information below. But you have to have a a set amount of, uh, you know, viewers and uh, on your videos and all that, and then you can qualify. So, you know, I, yeah, I'd love to have a big channel and do that. I don't know if I'd still want to go out and do the film critic thing, but the point is it, it, you don't have to have formal training. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't necessarily help sometimes. And my opinion is, yes, a bad tomato score um, on the tomato meter uh, usually usually indicates, um, you know, I mean, I guess if you're going to have to bet money on it, then you should bet with the score because it is an accumulation of, you know, a large amount of submissions from people that at least have some substance to them and they've at least grinded it out enough to meet these requirements and like I said I'll link below so you if you don't want to go in with expectations don't watch a review sometimes I don't watch reviews but I also can separate it in my mind and also not only should you look at the the that's like just your broad look like that's like the least amount that you can do you can just look at the tomato meter but what you should do and what I recommend you do is like what I have I have about four to five different uh, sources for where I get my reviews and I get my uh, breakdowns from in um, three of those are on YouTube. I'll tell you they are. I got Chris Stuckerman, who, uh, from what I can tell, I don't know the guy personally, but has a, a very similar uh, background uh, when we were talking about formal training. He is not a, a Juilliard graduate or a NYC film school grad, but he uh, has studied film, and I think he currently is studying film uh, on, on a, in a structured, formal manner. Um, 
then you have Jeremy Johns that uh, I don't know, and I, I didn't look into him that much, but I've been watching him for a long time. I don't know much about his past other than re- work to retail, but he seems to me that he is just really um, – he is really informed and really um, passionate about film and television, and he has a good sense of what he likes. I, I believe that he has a lot of the same expectations for movies that I do, and he is pretty intelligent. I mean, you don't have to go to film school to know what cinematography is or to talk about tones. Uh, you know what I mean? So you kind of got to mix it up. And then I also, the last one on YouTube and I was probably is uh, what the flick, which is a great, great, great little source because those people, there's a group of them and, and they, they're usually the same people. And, uh, but they, they have people that come in and just do special reviews for shows or movies, blah, blah, blah. Um, and they're, but they're all professional critics. Um, you know, by whatever standards you they all write for, for respected publications or have a um substantial following on social media so uh you get a good good sense you can get your real like your real formal opinion on it and actually one of the editor-in-chief is on there from tomatoes so you know you get you just gotta like watch these people find some go out there and do the work if you're so worried about it go and find some critics that you know like i said it's just i take things into consideration be realistic not everybody's like you good it's a good thing just watch some people find people that you can you can come to the conclusion that they're sensible. Uh, you don't have to know about uh, the editing process, about this, about the adaptation into a screenplay, about uh, any of the complexities of, you know, when you, if you want to get into the nitty gritty, because I don't know shit about cars, so I wouldn't want some car mechanic, you know, breaking down every single freaking nut and bolt. Um, so go and find out for yourself. Don't just, if you, if you don't, like Rotten Tomatoes, which, like, again, I'm not saying I love it, but as of right now, it's better than, like, the Nielsen system, where, like, a person that's 30 years old, single, or has, you know, like, a 30-year-old single man that lives in Washington is going to be chosen for, um, (laughs) to be a Nielsen viewer, and they are going to represent, like, 500,000, uh, Caucasian 30-year-old single men, that that's way worse in my opinion so at least you have people that had to meet some sort of standard and it is not a easy one to meet for everybody so uh i don't you shouldn't take what they say with a grain of salt but they have their individual reviews so find somebody that that you think is sensible (laughs) that's my view on that so that's it on that um now to what i think the sensible sensible people We'll think of some of these summer movies. And number five is um, a big movie that premiered at South by Southwest, uh, Silicon Valley actor uh, Kamal Najani. And it's a very compelling story. I won't dive into it all, but it deals with being a Pakistani American in Chicago right after 9 11. Uh, it's a romantic comedy that deals with the issue of uh, inter- interracial relationships and uh, also sickness and death. And it's a very uh, compelling story from the outline that I read. And if it's done well, like I said, it was received very well. Romantic comedies that tackle serious issues, in my opinion. Is, is that's just amazing to me and that's artistry that it might seem silly but and some people think oh there's no place for laughing in serious matters but um and i agree in some aspects that's true yeah that wouldn't have worked in schindler's list but that wasn't the tone of the movie you know um nobody was cracking jokes but there are a lot of instances in life it's not just white or black and it's gray there's always a, some levity in life, you know, even in times, uh, I'm sure everybody that's listening or watching has had some traumatic experience or, you know, even in the worst of times that one of your buddies or a family member or spouse or significant other, maybe you smile or laugh and, you know, something funny happened, uh, you know, uh, at the hospital that day. It doesn't mean that grandpa dying wasn't a sad event. It means that life was happening. So to do that, to navigate that minefield of being uh, tasteful and respective of uh, respectful of the the issues you're tackling well um having that levity and that realism is is very very hard line to walk but when it's walked correctly it is awesome highly entertaining and um relatable and also informative so i think this uh 
this got a wide release. That's awesome. Uh, uh, and the number four will be Dunkirk, uh, Christopher Nolan. Not much I have to say about this. I mean, I know a lot of people are loving the trailer. Killen Murphy, Tom Hardy, so on. Uh, a lot of the regular guys Nolan uses. Nolan knows how to take, take big stories and condense them, if that makes sense. He knows how to... Um, he, he knows how to contain, uh, how to tell a story of a big event uh, really well through a few eyes and really bring it down to earth. And the events of Dunkirk, it is really shortly, if you don't know, it's very interesting but very traumatic. It is the English and French soldiers that are trying to evacuate France after the blitz by the Germans when they just totally got, you got to understand, in World War II. When they first did their, um, when, when the Germans first... Um, entered France and in places like Poland and they used the, what was known as the Blitzkrieg. It was something, I mean, before you dug trenches, you held ground, you moved up a few inches and you lost those yards or inches and it was, you know, grinding it out. This was modern warfare. This was tanks along with infantry. This was air support. This was, you know, um, th- this was, this was crazy to people. They, they got rolled the fuck over hundreds of thousands of troops the troops that are stuck on the beaches of the channel that can almost see home some that can just go out into the ocean and um drown rather than uh be subjected to the strafing by the lufapa uh both sides you know civilian and naval um sailors died a lot of them died trying to get you know their 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 boys and the french over to uh the england side just so they could F- figure out how to fight the fucking war so I mean, this looks really good i think that this is surprising it's coming out when it is um i hope it's not and i i highly doubt it'll just end up being a big action piece i hope that it is representative of nolan's past work and i, I think we don't have too much to worry about so if it is it will definitely win some awards so my number three is a film called All Eyes on Me. This movie is about Tupac Shakur, and it's about his life uh, from his early days on, uh, in New York to his evolution of being one of the world's uh, arguably most famous and still very, very famous uh, rappers and artists of all time. And this has, there's been documentaries, I remember back uh, uh, over 10 years ago, I went and saw, uh, I forget what it, what it was, but it was it was more of a like talking head uh, documentary like a documentary made for television that was just screened in movies but this is a uh, d- pretty decent cast some of these uh, producers and writers have worked on um, Straight Outta Compton so it should be very very interesting and if this is a um, if this is a good portrayal and doesn't look like a made for TV movie which I don't think it will uh, itself some uh, critical acclaim and it could if it's uh, if it's done well I mean look at it, Straight Outta Compton won Oscar and uh, killed it at the box office and leading me to my number two, which is uh, called appropriately Detroit, which is where I'm from, and it, it stars uh, John Bogoya from Star Wars, and uh, it's coming out August 4th, and it is depicting the 1967 um, riots in Detroit that uh, was one of the largest citizen uprisings uprisings in the United States history. Um, actually, if you've ever seen Gaines of New York, that's the first biggest riot that you see in that movie. Uh, at the end, the first largest, uh, it's the third largest uh, citizen uprising slash riot, whatever you want to call it, in American history. The first one, if you've ever seen American, uh, if you've ever seen Games of New York, the um, riot that's depicted at the end of that movie when they're doing the uh, lottery draft for the Civil War, um, that is the first and still the largest, not the first, that is still the largest uh, citizen uprising in United States history. Then and you have the, the 1992 L.A. riots um, after the events with Rodney King, and then you have um, 1967 Detroit. So I'm surprised they're not waiting till Oscar season, which is kind of cool. Coming in at number one is Al Gore's Inconvenient uh, Sequel. Al Gore's new film, uh, a follow-up to The Inconvenient Truth, and it is an uh, inconvenient sequel, Truth to Power. Uh, in this, I'm going to, like I said, I link everything below. Watch this trailer. This is this is very, very relevant, obviously, um, and this is going to piss a lot of people off, and it's going to make a lot of people uh, very, very pe- happy. People are going to either love or hate this, and he is going hard at the establishment. He is going hard at the perception of the um, power structure at the moment. So this this could actually 
kill it at the box office. I'm just not sure of how wide a release it's going to get. Uh, it, it received two standing applause at Sundance, and those people are pretty, uh, pretty uh, stingy. They're they are they are movie aficionados, so they don't they don't um, get on their knees and start praising anything real quick. But uh, again, it, it's not too surprising. I'm trying to say bias. I do definitely way more to the left, but it isn't surprising that it, for what will be called a liberal movie um, to get a standing ovation at a um, film festival. But there's nothing wrong with that. So, but I just don't want to anger anybody that might not, uh, you know, identify with the. Um, the scientific research that has been conducted about the death of our earth so uh yeah go check it out and then you can either say it's fake news or a fake movie or whatever or um you know learn something so yeah that's my number one so uh hopefully these movies do well and hopefully people do like them uh you know a lot of these movies that i mentioned almost every single one of these movies that i mentioned uh i think that when it comes down to it that these movies you know they're very very different than the movies that i picked for the box office uh um success for for yielding the highest fiscal um gains it it comes down to movies with more substance take more risks and they're either going to be really good or really bad transformers is probably just going to be fun i mean look at the fate of the furious nothing wrong with that movie but that is not like a like i mean a guy probably might have sat around and played with you know micro machines and gi joes and and, and videotaped it and used it as his uh storyboard you know uh but it's entertaining i get that there's there's a time when you want to sit down and think and you want to have something that makes you think and then there's a time when you want to turn your brain off so uh the fate of the furious transformers and stuff like that those are the, br the brain turn off movies and they don't have an agenda and stuff so there's something to say about that as well but um you know to each their own find a nice healthy mix of things in your life and that's the best way to go just five movies that I'm looking forward to that I want to see this summer. And I am going to start with King Arthur here. Is definitely, I can tell from this trailer that uh, we're, we're looking at issues with with it being choppy especially if a risk but i'm very excited for wonder woman i am very excited uh for wonder woman i like i said i talked about it before i talked about all these before so i won't waste any more time but wonder woman looks great you know uh i hope i hope dc worked out the king i hope dc didn't work out the kings i hope they kept their fucking hands off it i hope they let the people make the film and then they're like hey let's not do freaking screenings let's not do focus groups when people fill out freaking surveys i mean that's ridiculous so that that's when you get suicide squad also when you make somebody write a script in two weeks so uh yeah um the next one is going to be detroit uh, it just looks very impactful it looks like it's got a lot of substance behind it it's very interesting it's from my hometown but i with all the recent events with the police shootings um black lives matter and all that i think this is a very topical movie and i hope it uh I hope, it, I hope it addresses both sides in a responsible manner and is not only entertaining but informative. And I think the next one is Dunkirk. You already heard my mini history uh, documentary on that. Christopher Nolan, Tom Hardy, uh, Killen Murphy. True story, can't beat it. Uh, next one, All Eyes on Me. I was a white suburban Detroit kid uh, that loved Tupac. I still do. I was a DJ for a long time in clubs and respect his... Uh, artistry and i think that his work still uh it stands up today and that is not true for a lot of rap especially so um notable mentions thor ragnarok and uh the dark tower definitely movies to look out for justin thomas make sure to like and subscribe and i will see you guys in a few friends that is friends that the winner will allow the loser all the proper funeral rituals totally did right no now you know who you're fighting the king in the north in my dream. You make me happy when the skies are Did gray. it ever once occur to you that I might have some insight? What should I do differently? I don't know. I don't know anything about battles. Oh, that's good advice. If you think this has a happy ending, you haven't been paying attention.